It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to. Lots to talk about. Hope everyone had a good Memorial Day weekend. Safe, healthy, happy. Uh, You know, Memorial Day is a time to honor and remember the brave men and women who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. And the hope is as we spent time with our family and friends, I hope we took a moment to reflect on the courage and dedication of those who have served in our armed forces and have sacrificed for our country. Uh, and for the hardworking individuals in our community, uh, this this holiday, sh- you know, show that their service uh, is something that is valued, uh, a reminder of the values that we all cherish, uh, the dedication, uh, the resilience, a strong sense of duty and community, uh, all of that, uh, the sacrifices of the past, the present, uh, the men and women who keep our country running and contribute to the strength and prosperity of our nation. Thank you. This is a time to reflect and to let those who have done so much know that those sacrifices, those contributions, they are valued and greatly appreciated. It's up to us, honestly, to remember and honor honor the memory of our fallen heroes uh, by continuing to uphold the principles that they, they fought for. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, the idea of of one nation. And it, it got me thinking, this sense of community, this sense of togetherness. I fear we're not that country. My entire lifetime, we've been sold this idea that we're, we're individuals. Uh, hooray for me, the heck with everyone else. The one who wins uh, at the end has the most toys. You know, that kind of greed is good. Uh, that kind of hyper-individualist capitalist mentality that we've been force-fed for the last 50 years. I I feel as if we've we've come to kind of the head. And and it it, it brings itself in the form of Donald Trump. Look, Donald Trump didn't do this. Donald Trump is the the result of the kind of greed, the kind of self-centeredness, the kind of vitriol that uh, we are now finding ourselves in. He's that he's kind of the the poster child. And again, didn't do it, but is the one that is well, I, I would argue benefiting from it, but is just the, you know, the end result. And I look at what his Memorial Day message was. On his truth social. He wrote, happy Memorial Day to all. And had he ended right there, good on him. That's what an adult does. That's what a, that's what a, a politician does. But he went on to say, happy Memorial Day to all, including the human scum that is working so hard to destroy our once great nation. And to the radical left, Trump-hating federal judge in New York. And then went on to a whole list of grievances uh, about the E. Jean Carroll decision, about the $91 million that uh, he's going to have to pay in defamation uh, f- fines, um, you know, just down the list of, of grievance after grievances, you know, the $500 million that he's going to have to pay out because lost another court trial, uh, a lot of, a lot of stuff, but it was about him. It wasn't about the day. It wasn't about, as I said, Memorial Day is about remembering the sacrifices of those who had the courage and the conviction to stand up, swear to defend this country, and then then do that. I don't know that, that the kind of whining grievance that we see coming out of Trump was part of that. So it got me thinking about this idea of of community, this idea of togetherness, this idea of being an American. That we are all in this together. Instead of what we've been force-fed. And and this came to me in... in, A listener sent me a... uh, 
I found out later it's a Facebook post of of what I think is satire, but I'm not entirely sure given the way things are this in this day and age. But it was a letter written supposedly by an employer to the staff. And it was basically saying that, you know, when you're not working, uh, you've got to be you've got to be accessible. I've got to be able to reach you when I need you. So when I'm when there's 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 people who get sick or don't come to work, I'm going to call you and you better be here for um, how did they put it for voluntary mandatory shift coverage. And I don't know how voluntary and mandatory come together, but. That's in this, which is why it leads me to thinking it's it's satirical. And understand, I believe good satire is a mirror into reality. So this letter, while I think satirical from people I know and have talked to, this is their reality. The employer thinks that they're at their beck and call every moment of every day. And you better be accessible or you're going to get written up and, and fired because you can be fired for just about anything. But in one part, they, it asks the question, how can I best serve the company? Uh, when you are thinking about not answering your phone while on your day off or on vacation, how can you best serve the company? That's not how it always was. We've been trained to be loyal to the corporations, but not to each other. We've been trained to be divided and, and pick our political team by which hat we we wear, and then never, never cross over and, and discuss with others. Never find that way together. And I've been in, a, in this mindset for a while. This, this has been a while in, in the making of going, the only way I see that this country comes back together uh, is, a, is a couple of ways. One, we have a great, great catastrophe where the, the kind of mass pain and suffering, like a Great Depression and the starvation and, the, and, the, and the, the poverty that came out of that, brings us somewhat together. A great war of some sort, which again, nobody wants. But sadly, it's the only way I think we do eventually put down our grievances and forget about the past and move and think about the forward. I don't know that we're capable of it right now. And look, it's going to mean people on all sides of the political spectrum are going to have to forgive the other, put down their grievances and their hatred and, and figure out how to get stuff done. Because right now we're not getting anything done. There aren't things really getting done that are making people's lives better. So for me, the other part of this was, as a union guy, the thing, the, the commonality, the community that comes out of, out of a union environment that's a, a good way to reunite the country. Said it for, for for a couple for years now. You want to reunite the country, reunionize. You've got to have people who have some kind of common connection. And this came to me, you know, unfortunately, because uh, my motorcycle broke down on the side of the highway. Uh, I have a Harley, and uh, it, it it broke down. Uh, <laughs> and as I sat there for four hours waiting for the tow truck. Had I known it was been four hours, I'd have walked home and got my, my truck and dr drug at home. But I sat there for four hours. And over those four hours, there had to be at least 30, 40 people who stopped to see if I was okay. Uh, did you run out of gas? Something I can help you with. You got someone coming. Do you need to make a call? It almost seemed like how things were when I was a kid, when I was younger when people did look out for each other, regardless of their political stripes. And understand, a good number of the people who stopped had Trump bumper stickers. But we were part of a, a, a community. You know, people who ride motorcycles, bikers, are part of something of a community. And they look out for each other. I believe the same is, is about work and about unions. The ability for people to find that common thing, that that thread that makes each other human. And then we can begin to have those tough conversations where we disagree and how we don't burn each other's bridges down because we don't agree. And I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, I, I've talked about this a couple of times here on the program, and and I stand by what I, what I said. Uh, my union, I've been a Teamster for the better part of 35 years. They are entertaining endorsing Donald Trump. 
Uh, the, the president, the general president of the Teamsters, uh, did a pilgrimage to Magalago, did a whole kind of hostage situation uh, photo shoot. And, you know, again, don't know what, what that meeting was about, what was said. I've had some, some inklings. I've had some people tell me some stuff. I don't know. But I do know out of that came some money for the RNC, some money for Josh Hawley. So Republicans were starting to get some money. You could say that's a good thing. The Teamsters are trying to find some common ground. And in any other day, I would say, yeah, that's something we should be doing. You talk to your enemies. You talk to people who disagree with you. You talk to people who want to destroy you in the hopes that maybe maybe they, they don't want to. And I get that. But not in Trump's case. Trump has been very clear of what his actions will be in the future based on what they were in the past. So when I came out and said, I, I, I think the, the leadership was wrong. I think it was a stupid idea to do. I think it's a failure of leadership. I stand by that. That has pulled apart part of our community, which does nothing more than make the other side thrilled. If they can divide a stronghold for working people, they're even more thrilled. So my frustration is, is what we've done is, again, we've divided people. Uh, we've trained people to, to focus on their divisions, not their commonalities. We've trained people to think about their hatreds instead of their, their likes and their, their, their wants for a better future. Again, we've been trained to be loyal to something other than each other. And, and look, you know, the, the, ourselves. You know, I grew up wanting to do better. You know, I want to make better wages. I want to have better conditions. I want my kids to have better opportunities. I want, you know, all these things. But I want you to have them too. So when I talk about my, my Teamsters Union negotiates really good health care benefits for me, I don't say that because, hey, look what I got. I say that because look what I've got and how can we get it for you? How can we expand this? How can we give opportunity to everyone? And instead, what we've been sold, and, and look, I've, I've done organizing over the years. You know, we're told quite often that if you demand too much, you know, we'll just up and move the company to Mexico and you'll get nothing. You know, we've been sold this idea that as we climb the socioeconomic ladder, we've got to tear down the guy ahead of us instead of pulling someone up behind us. We've been told that that your your win is my loss and vice versa. So it's the old Vince Lombardi. It's, you know, winning's not the, the uh, everything. It's the only thing. And I keep coming back to this position of how do we come back to that, that thing that my grandparents' generation understood. They didn't always agree with each other, but they had common ground. They fought fascism overseas. They came home. They built the most prosperous working class in the history of humanity. And had their disagreements, had their fights, had their squabbles. But on those things that brought them together, their churches, their clubs, their unions, you, know, you name it, they found commonality. They found togetherness. Now you go, but you know, Rick, it sounds to me like you're just, you're reaching for the past that, that is idealized. And some of it is. But I also remember as a kid, you know, you broke down on the side of the highway, truckers pulled over to stop. People pulled over to help. You see people on the side of the road today, it's rare anyone stops. Everyone is, oh, they got cell phones. Oh, though someone else will do it. We're not that community of helpers anymore. We're not that community of how can we take care of our, our neighbor and, and help them. And the example came to me. Uh, I, I saw something in, 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 a, uh, in a rail yard that, that caught my attention. I remember years ago, a guy dropped a trailer. Don't know how. Forgot to uh, to roll up the uh, to roll down the, the legs, and just drove out from under it, and boom, down it went. Uh, he would have been charged an accident because it's kind of what it is. To his defense, came four other guys, four other truckers, and they surrounded him so that no one could see in what was going on. And they got out and they helped him crank this trailer back up. Now, this is this is one incident, very minor, but for me, it speaks volumes. You know, 30 years ago, people were willing to, you know, hey, how can we how can we help you? 
How can we get this situation done? Uh, I recently saw a guy drop a trailer and two people were videotaping it. And it was one of those things where you go, this is a very different society than what I grew up in. And it's a very different society than what I want to live in. Uh, because, you know, those two people who are videotaping instead of helping, it's all about them. It's all about what they're going to get out of this at someone else's expense. And, and the reason I, I think this is all important on this, uh, as we, as we you know, figure out how we honor those who give so much, is by how do we take care of each other? And it's, it's frustrating to me. Now, there are glimpses of hope out there. Like I said, I broke down on the side of the road. And what, what did I have come to me? People who wanted to be helpful because they thought I was part of their community. How do we enlarge our community? We're Americans. All of us. How do we take care of each other? That's the question I've got. I want to hear yours. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show dot com. Uh, do you think we're capable of returning to a time where it wasn't just a hooray for me and the heck with everybody else? And if I win, you have to lose. Do you think there's a chance for us moving forward? Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show dot com. Quick break. Right back. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I got an email the other day that uh, pointed out there's some memes going around in some social media posts of Joe Biden uh, saying that, you know, every trucker out there with an eighth grade education uh, or a high school education knows they're likely not to have a job in the next three or four or five years. And, you know, again, the meme is, you know, Joe Biden's doing this. Joe Biden's going to destroy all the all the truck driving jobs. Joe Biden's going to bring us automation. Joe Biden's doing all the same thing they've done with the economy. Understand when when uh, people are struggling, you blame somebody. And look, you know, the buck stops on Biden's desk. He's got to do a much better job of explaining what's going on and the direction we're going. Uh, but understand, you know, our media culture is all about. Uh, the negative. It's all about what divides us. It's all about what 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 gets us angry. Because what gets us angry makes us click on stuff. So when you see all these stories going, we're in a recession. We're going to have a recession. There's a recession around the corner, even though there's none, and we're not in one. Um, but still, you you're playing on people's fear. You have when you have politics at the lowest level of Maslow's hierarchy of just pure pure survival, basic instinct. It's no wonder. People think the economy's terrible. And and look, I guarantee you, if Trump wins in November, uh, January 20th of 2025, uh, the morning newspaper on the 21st will be a uh, best economy ever. Donald Trump turns the economy around in one afternoon. Because that's what our media does. It's that nice pivot. Uh, now, you know, Biden is being credited with saying this, and he did. He did say that every trucker out there with an eighth grade education or high school education knows they're likely not to have a job in the next three, four, or five years. That's true. I've been saying that for a while. I've been telling my truck driver buddies, get ready for it. Are you planning? Are you saving? 
Uh, are you thinking about what you're going to do next when this comes? Because it is coming. It's been on the, the writing's been on the wall for a while. And policymakers, are you thinking about what you're going to do with a couple million high school educated men, mostly men? There are some women in trucking, but the most of it is middle aged men. What are you going to do with all of those people? And I would argue fairly well armed. And, and I would also argue not really stable, not really social people. We truck drivers tend to be a little antisocial and a little angry. So what are you going to do with a bunch of well-armed, angry, antisocial men? Uh, policymakers got to figure this out. But this idea of what social media, the right is pushing out as Biden's doing this is, well, idiocy. But it plays to the, to the narrative that everything's bad under Biden. You know, Biden did all this stuff. He's got a switch in the White House. He's taking over industries. You know, he's controlling our economy, which again, I don't know when we became a socialist country. You ask conservatives and they think we are there. We think everything gets gets run out of the White House. It doesn't. Business roundtable, now we got a conversation, but not out of the White House. Uh, now, the first thing I thought of, you know, is this possibly AI? Is it possible that, you know, even though it's a true statement, is it possible that hey, this is an AI thing? Because now it seems kind of weird to just pop up now. Turns out it was a campaign uh, editorial board um, conversation that Biden had with the Des Moines Register uh, back, you know, after Christmas of 2019. Actually said it and, and properly quoted. I watched the video and he was saying, look, as policymakers, we've got to we've got to figure this out. Now, my problem with what he said, and we, I got a problem with what he said, is the same problem I had with Bill Clinton. Uh, as we were losing manufacturing jobs, as we were us losing those good union jobs that supported a family with good income and good benefits, the response was, well, yeah, we're going to lose all those dirty jobs, but we're going to replace it with, with educated jobs. We're going to get you education. Now, understand, most of us that went into trucking didn't go into it because well, we were really book smart. Uh, most of us went into it because it's a good paying job. It's a good, honest, hardworking job. And it gave us the ability to make a good wage. I got into it, you know, after college because it was the best money that I could make. And when I started in the LTL industry back in the, in the, in the late eighties, it, it was a gold standard working class job. Uh, it has declined over the decades and stagnated uh, because union density has fallen so badly in that industry. When I started, 85% of the, the LTL carriers in this country were unionized. Now you're down to about 10. So the wages, and let's not forget about deregulation that caused massive, massive numbers of unemployment and companies to go broke. But the message to working people were, well, you just go get an education. We'll retrain you to do some other low paying job that's never going to get you to the standard of living that you had. And this is why I've been saying for, for probably 10 years now that on the trucking front, you need to make those drivers whole. Uh, you need a technology tax. As these companies move to automated vehicles, uh, there needs to be a, tech a technology tax that follows that automated vehicle. So yeah, you're going to pay a salary. There may not be someone in the truck, but for a period of time, you're going to pay a salary to get someone to the end of the road. Someone in their 50s who you're sorry, you're not going to be able to retrain for a, a, a job making the kind of money that they were making in mass, maybe a handful. You have a technology tax to make them whole. Now, I've heard people say, that's a ridiculous idea. Well, I don't hear anything else out there. So for me, this should be a wake-up call more than an attack moment. This should be a wake-up call to our elected leaders that we've got big problems on the horizon with robotics and automation and AI and all of this stuff that's coming. The tsunami of job losses that are going to come because of this. Now, will there be opportunity? Most certainly. But in this transition, there will be pain and struggle. And this election cycle, as I look at what's going on, I keep asking myself, who do I think is going to be um, better at, at, at dealing with this problem going forward? Who's going to be better for working people to deal with, with the obstacles that are coming as our economy has a massive transition like never before seen in history? And the speed of which it's going to come is going to be mind-blowing. Who do I want to do that? Do I want Donald Trump or do I want Joe Biden? 
because those are my choices. I don't get to go, oh, gee, I would like to have someone else, please. No, you got two choices. That's it. Right now, that's it. And Donald Trump has proven to me time and time again, he doesn't really care about working people. There's just there's nice rhetoric, does a nice job talking. Uh, went, he evidently went to my Teamsters union and had a roundtable discussion where they made him sound great. You know, he's 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 OK with, you know, this, he, he's in favor of the states doing right to work. He won't do a federal right to work. <laughs> that was a selling point. But right now, who's working on this stuff and who in the working class is talking about it? I know my Teamsters union is working on automation. They've been working on it for a while. And we would love to have people come on this program and talk about it. Uh, we've reached out to them numerous times. Not sure if it's uh, if they don't want to talk to me or if it's they're not ready to, to talk about what they're working on. Because there is so nothing out there. And this is where we as voters have to get on the right issue, on the right track and in the right direction. Because while you may not be a truck driver and worried about losing your job, those jobs are attached to so much more. So, again, my mind goes back to this place. How do we use the best policy to help move this country forward? How do we protect workers from the, 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 the ills of what is coming? Look, technology is going to make some people's lives better, going to make a lot more people's lives worse. How do you mitigate that? I've heard people tell me, well, what we need to do, we need to you know, dig up some ideas from Uncle Milton, Milton Friedman, uh, have, a, have a negative tax. And whether it's Friedman's negative tax or, or Andrew Yang's universal basic income, it's still the same thing. It's giving money to, wor to working people to participate in the economy because the robots can make all the stuff they want. If there's nobody there to buy it, you don't have an economy. So for me, this, this is an interesting moment. And for me, it's the policy that comes out of it that's important. It's like, this is one of those honest questions. Who on the policy front do you trust more? Democrats who care about workers and the wages and the, the benefits and the things that, that go on with working families or the conservatives who tell you, no, no, no let the economy do what it's going to do. The invisible hand, the free market, let corporation run, run amok. Loyalty to corporation above all. That's kind of the question. And only you can make the answer. And I want to hear it. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Quick break. Right back. So with yesterday being Memorial Day, you know, I got to tell you, you know, while we were uh, you know, watching the events unfold of honoring those who sacrificed, I, I got to tell you, I, I couldn't, I could, my mind couldn't stop wandering from the reality that all the flags that we see, all of the, the patriotism, all the attire being worn, you know, it made me think, you know, how much of that stuff's made here in the U.S.? And then it got me going, you know, I wonder how much, what percentage of U.S. flags are made actually in the U.S.? So I started looking at a bunch of articles, and one of the things that surprised me, uh, an Atlantic article from uh, 4th of July of 2018 talking about Trump's tariffs uh, and one thing being excluded from the, the tariffs being the American flag. And as, as they wrote, a harbinger of economic globalization and a source for nationalist anxiety from these foreign-made flags have so far escaped the president's tariffs, uh, yet for the past two decades, and most recently on Flag Day, Congress has introduced bipartisan legislation to restrict or ban these imports. And again, you would think that would be the one thing that everyone would go, yeah, yeah, we, the thing that we're flying, that we're standing under, that people sacrificed for, yeah, we should be able to at least make that here, no? Uh, so here to share some thoughts on maybe maybe it's just me and maybe I should be thinking of something else on these holidays. But I've asked our good friend Scott Paul to come talk with us. Scott's the president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing, AmericanManufacturing.org, the website. Scott, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, Rick. Great to be with you. So I, I got to tell you, I, I feel there's part of me that feels bad that my mind wanders in this direction. But it, it seems logical, doesn't it? It does seem logical, and I'll, I'll just share a brief story with you. you know, my uh, my dad is laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery, so we we went, um, and uh, 
And on Sunday is the one day a year where the public can also put flowers at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers, and my boys and I did that. And you're, we were surrounded by people who were wearing uh, a lot of patriotic attire, and I thought the same thing that you did, right? <laughs> totally. is like I, I saw the brands, and I saw kind of like the, the, the flag shirts, and I was like, there's not a single one of these that's made in the United States. And I was like, do the people know? Do the people care? Uh, and, and then I think the same thing goes for American flags. It's like, I wonder if people just assume that they're made in the United States or if they're just not looking at the, at the country of origin at all. And, and I'll tell you why it matters. I mean, um, and, and part of it is obviously symbolic, but, but to me, it's one of the really easy things to get right, okay? I mean, it's one of those things when it comes to purchasing, you know, made in the United States that should be a pretty easy thing to do if you're buying a, an American flag or some sort of other projection of patriotism. And so if you can't get that right, how are you going to get the harder stuff right, too, uh, yeah. where, where, where it's more difficult? And so I do think that it's a good reminder that the way to be, I think, truly um, a, a patriot is to not only express that through the clothes that you're wearing, but but y- you know you you also need to have some intent into where they're coming from because you know there's a chance you could be helping a, a veteran or a veteran's family if you're buying American. There's probably not much of a chance if you're buying an import. Uh, that, that is that is patriotic attire. So, so so let's let's you know let's encourage folks to think about this a little more holistically. And I know that's one of the you know that's one of the goals that I think we have is to you know when people are buying stuff for Flag Day or the Fourth of July or Veterans Day or Memorial Day um, th- that there's a little more thought going into it uh, because I would just say there are a lot of American made options for the yeah. stuff that we're talking about. You just have to, I mean, you have to look for it. It takes two steps instead of one. Um, and, uh, but but it's something that we all can do, Rick. I, I totally agree with you. And I mean, for, at least for that, I mean, it's not like I'm asking people to, to actually follow the flag code. Uh, I'm just saying, you know, maybe maybe we'll, that one yeah. thing that you're buying, uh, be a little bit more aware of uh, as you're, because, you know, I, I don't buy that people didn't know. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I think that most people, I think in this day and age, I think we 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 know where things are being made. I think we're either deliberately not, you know that that uh, what is it what is it pl- plausible deniability? Oh, I didn't look, I didn't know, yeah. or you just don't care where things are made. It is all yeah. about hey, how cheap can I get it? And that that to me is problematic, especially when you're talking about you know the symbol of the country, and right. especially if that's the thing that you're going to to present to me in the world uh, as the, something very important to you. I, I guess it just, there's a lot that goes into this for me. So, yeah. uh, but I wanted to throw that out because, you know, it, yeah. because I think what, what you know we then have to go is look, uh, you know, if we're going to have a country that's, you know, that's growing and the American dream alive and well, uh, we do need to, to worry about, you know, domestic production, to, you know, for the things that we need. And recently Janet Yellen, the treasury secretary uh, was reported by Bloomberg saying that it's critical for the U S and Europe to kind of come together in a united front against these Chinese, uh, against the Chinese Communist Party's industrial overcapacity, and she said, "Look, you know, the this this impact on the globe on the macroeconomic balances is huge. Probably should have to do something." So my mind goes, if we can't get the flag right, if we can't do that one thing that we may buy once every couple of years, how we get into the rest of it? Yeah. You, you're right about that. What one more vignette on the on the patriotic stuff is there was a uh, th- there was a, a guy who was making kind of patriotic things and y- y- literally like stripping off the made in China stuff um, from it, selling it as made in America. He got dinged by the Federal Trade Commission because made in America is a very valuable brand, as as we know. Right. And he claimed that he was being persecuted by the government for his because he was a Trump supporter. And I'm like, no, actually, you're not. It's because you you can't do the basic things right. I mean, you don't try to sell patriotic stuff and call it made in the U- USA uh, when you're when it's actually literally made in China, and you're just pocketing, um, you know, you're you're just pocketing the proceeds 
of all of that and trying to hoodwink people. So no, we're not gonna let you get away with that. And, and, and on a larger scale, that's exactly what Secretary Yellen is saying. And, and also that like, you know, we saw the original play out of this China shock, all the, all the, all the Chinese unfair trade practices that completely devastated the United States uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, it's like, we've seen this before, the sequel is gonna be horrible if we don't get in front of it. And so I think that is what uh, I, I, I wanna lift up because for a change, you have um, a treasury secretary, you have a president, you have a trade representative and a cabinet that's like, we have to get ahead of this. We can't wait until the damage is done to our workers, to our industries, to our capabilities. Uh, we need to get out in front of it. And um, the best tool we have is tariffs. It's not the World Trade Organization. They won't do anything, or it's not just talking to the Chinese because they will say one thing and do another thing. Um, and um, I think I would just say, unlike the last administration too, it's to enlist your allies so that it's a more effective approach so that they're, so that China's not pitting you know, one trading block against another and that we're all saying that, no, you're not going to do this in a way that's going to royal factory workers and their communities um, all over Europe or the United States when it comes to uh, electric vehicles or solar panels or uh, even basic industrial uh, materials like steel or aluminum. And so um, what I am hopeful, and, and is, is the case here, Rick, is that the United States has taken action. You know, uh, Biden has put higher tariffs in place on Chinese steel, on Chinese aluminum, 100% tariffs on Chinese EVs, um, as well as solar panels, batteries, a variety of other things like that. And now we need the Europeans uh, to do the same thing. Um, and it will have an impact. And, and I don't know that it will get China to change the way that it approaches its economy and certainly not with uh, Xi Jinping heading up the country, uh, but it will limit the damage to everybody else. Um, and, and before anybody says, well, actually having this flood of Chinese imports is good because it keeps prices low. Um, again, what happens is, uh, you know, the, a corporation may drop a price by a couple of pennies, but they're going to pocket most of the profits. And the damage that is done with the job losses is permanent. You know, it's not like the little sugar rush you get from getting that great deal um, on, on a consumer product. It's like the damage is is generational when it comes to those factory closures. So I I am I'm super super pleased that we're trying to get out in front of this uh, and and do it uh, before. Uh, there's this second wave of uh, Chinese imports or what some people are calling like the China shock 2.0. Yeah. No, it goes back to the question I always ask, you know, what are you? Are you a worker first or are you a consumer first? Where's your mindset first? Are you about protecting your job and and the, and the way you bring money into the household or is it, hey, we got to have the cheapest price? Uh, I mean, you know, and that got to get the best deal. Uh, so that mindset to me is important. But I, I so, so since the, we, we hit this topic again, because we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, a lot of emails from from listeners who um, I'm, I'm going to use the ones that were were I'm not going to, you know, the, the you're absolutely right ones. These are the ones that had some questions of uh, uh, on the negative side. Uh, Brian yeah. writes, uh, tariffs aren't necessary. We cannot produce everything we need. We must import. Uh, to ha because we have an open market, if we are to get the things that we want and need, protectionism, he says, is a failure. Uh, how do you respond to that? Uh, Brian is, uh, I would say, mostly uh, incorrect on this. I mean, he's following the theory, and it is true. There is some stuff we need to import, uh, in part because we don't make it here. We don't make enough of it here. And if you think about bananas or coffee or some basic supplies, I think that is totally true because we have a big consumer market. We can't make absolutely everything. But that is not what the tariffs that, that Biden is trying to do are all about. This is talking about the high value thing and about the industries that we see as being a bigger part of the economy 
in 10, 20, 30 years and being able to have some of that rather than having China have all of it, which is dangerous for a number of different reasons uh, where, where they can, you know, if, if we want more weaponized supply chains, if we want more supply chain whiplash, if we want less control over quality and inventory, uh, then by all means, yeah, let's not tariff, put tariffs on anything. But I think the way in which that Biden is approaching this is very strategic uh, and is saying that, you know, it's not healthy for uh, one country to basically make 90 percent of the world's solar equipment. Eventually, that's going to come back to to bite everybody in the butt. And so, we want to at least have some capacity in the United States to do that, to do high tech semiconductors, which are going to go into all sorts of uh, aerospace defense and uh, AI. Uh, types of applications. Uh, we want to be writing the rules for that. We want to be doing the inv- uh, innovation. We want to have the, the the skilled workers to do that. And so that's what the tariffs are about. And it's not just, uh, you, you know, it's, it's not just as simple as trying to f- find that theory out of a textbook. Uh, right. we, we have to we have to be able to respond to real world concerns here, Rick. And now, you know, and, and you know, I followed this up with also that, look, no one's saying that we should produce everything at home. And I agree, we we That's can't right. do everything. I think trade is important, but it's got to be mutually beneficial trade. It's got to be so, not the kind of mercantilist trade that we've had from China, where their goal is to dominate industries and destroy our capacity to produce, thus making them de- uh, making us dependent on them. And And I know that people don't believe that that's intentional, but I truly believe that it is. Yeah. You're right. It is. It's part of their plan. I mean, and it's not a secret. They've laid this out in a series of five-year plans uh, about the industries that they want to dominate, where they want to dominate global market share. And I think this is the thing. It's like, we're not saying make everything in the United States. We want balance, right? right? We want to export some stuff. We want to import some stuff. We want to make some stuff for our own market. We we consume 20% of the world's stuff right now, Okay. We have 5% of the world's population. We consume 20% of the world's stuff. We make only about, you know, 6 or 7% of the world's stuff, maybe even a little less than that. And in some cases for different categories, again, like I said, China makes 90% of, uh, the, of the world's stuff in a lot of, you know, in a lot of categories. And that's just out of whack. That is not healthy either. So having that balance is a right. much is much healthier from an economic I agree. James there. writes uh, that maybe I should read Milton Friedman. Uh, I'm not a huge <laughs> fan of Uncle Milty, but I, I had to throw this in there because I know you have. Uh, James says tariffs are going to make the already inflated cost of living go through the roof. Stop destroying the American dream, he writes. Um, yeah. th- response to the, to the Uncle Milty thing? Well, a true economist knows that tariffs in and of themselves are not inflationary. Uh, they can impact prices somewhat, but they don't actually necessarily impact price inflation. And you can consult Paul Krugman or a number of different Nobel economists to to verify that. Uh, and, and there's lots of evidence that the inflation that we saw was from fuel, uh, was from housing stock, uh, and, and was also from groceries none of which kind of had tariffs applied to it. So it doesn't kind of bear out that that, that was the, the major cause of inflation or that it would be for basically $20 billion worth of new tariffs in a $25 trillion economy. That is not going to be inflationary at all, but it is going to bring more jobs to the United States. The other flaw with all of this is fundamentally – what Milton Friedman, uh, you know, kind of uh, evangelized about was uh, to put shareholders first, right? You know, is that you you want uh, you want shareholders first, and that sort of attitude doesn't account at all for economic security, for national security, for uh, you know a bunch of different other concerns, which are very legitimate. And so I think uh, Milton Friedman. Uh, has been, uh, I'd say, largely debunked, uh, kind of like by lived experience over the last couple of decades. Um, So again, that's kind of like an outdated textbook theory 
that that is just not really reflected in the world around us. Right? Yeah, but I know people who you know they, they've they've he, he's been canonized. Uh, Saint Uncle Milty oh. is you know <laughs> what, what he says is gospel, even though as you pointed out, much of it has been uh, debunked. Real quick, I got uh, Brenda has one saying uh, you're starting a trade war uh, with with China. Uh, we are going to pay the price of it. Uh, William threw out there said you're pushing tariffs is dangerous. You seem to want a war with China. Do you realize Biden? is harming the international trade relations of the world and eventually the world will tie a turn on us what do you make of that because you know i've got a bunch of that you're starting a trade war you're 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 responsible scott uh what do you say to that well i would say that uh there there if you were going to consider it a trade war i don't i don't i don't know that i necessarily like to use the martial terms but uh, it's clear who started it was china uh, with, with, you know, with the complicity of global corporations, okay? It certainly wasn't the United States. We were just responding to repeated abuses, okay? And it wasn't even Biden who was the first one to respond. It was Trump. Uh, and so you have actually, you know, both presidents who have seen some harm, uh, you know, come to our, our country and, and want to respond to it. And so, look, I just have to say, you know, we have uh, low unemployment, uh, you know, even for uh, some, uh, you know, like uh, black men where, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, it's still higher than overall employment, uh, unemployment, but it's lower than it has been for a long time. You have inflation coming down. Uh, you have lots of jobs uh, that are available right now. You have a stock market at record highs. Um, and, uh, yeah, there are some things that we can still work on, like housing prices and child care and, and what have you, no doubt about that. But, um, we're, you know, we, from a macro and economic perspective, we're, we're doing pretty well yeah. and, and we've had these tariffs in place for a while. So I'm just, I'm just not buying that. But, Lastly, yeah. uh, uh, Mike, Mike has a, a thing uh, where he says, uh, evidently he says the lefty base uh, doesn't agree with us. Um, what do you make of that? Because, you know, I, I do see, and Mike's not wrong, I do see a lot of lefties, uh, you, know, you know, saying this is a bad idea, it's horrible, uh, because they've been sold in that neoliberal uh, trade frame that, you know, this, is, that this isn't that is the way to go about bringing China back into line. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that, those are really good points. And so I, I would say that what we're doing from an economic perspective, and, and again, this is a theory that's been debunked. There was this idea that if you have close economic interdependence that it will make you less likely to go to war. Actually, anybody who studied World War I knows that that was not the case, okay? There's lots of other factors that play into that. So, so that that's one of the theories. What we're doing with tariffs is a lot also different than what, say, China is doing with respect to Taiwan from a military perspective. And so to try to say that, that, that we're, we're being the aggressors and we're forcing China in, in, into doing things is, again, I think not the case. But from a progressive perspective, look, there is a legitimate conversation about whether tariffs are going to get in the way of making climate progress, okay? Uh, because a lot of the tariffs are aimed at these types of goods coming from China. My argument is that uh, support for the climate agenda collapses if it's not made in America. Who wants to just trade uh, oil produced by oligarchs uh, who abuse human rights, rights in the Middle East for, uh, for, for clean energy products coming from an autocratic country in Asia uh, that, that, that utilizes slave labor. Uh, that's not a that's not a good progressive trade off at nope. all. It's better if we make it here and have high standards for how the things are made and how the workers are treated, Rick. So that's that's my that's my callback to my progressive friends. There you uh, go. Uh, great answers. Love that. Hope folks will email more. Uh, email me Rick at the RickSmithShow dot com. Maybe we'll get some of them here on the program for Scott to address. Scott, as always, great stuff. All right, Rick. Thanks so much. And I, I love the listener questions. Keep them coming. Thanks so much. Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Right back. Stick around. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. 
On this day in labor history, the year was 1882. That was the day that John Muir, a Scottish-American conservationist, founded the Sierra Club in San Francisco, California. The Sierra Club's purpose was to explore, enjoy, and protect the wild places of the earth. Today, the organization has more than 1 million members and is one of the most well-known environmental organizations on the planet. The labor movement and the environmental movements in the United States have not always had an easy relationship. Too often, politicians and the media have framed policy decisions as a choice between good jobs and a clean environment. But during the 1990s, some environmentalists and unionists began to break down this divide. Both groups opposed the North American Free Trade Agreement, arguing it would have a negative impact on both jobs and the environment. During the massive protests of the World Trade Organization in 1999 in Seattle, labor protested alongside environmental activists. One memorable tagline to come out of the protest was, Turtles love Teamsters, Teamsters love Turtles. Then, in 2006, the Sierra Club partnered with the United Steelworkers to launch the Blue-Green Alliance. The effort joins together blue-collar workers with green environmental justice groups. The partnership seeks to supply policy and education about sustainable job growth in fields such as clean energy. Multiple environmental groups and unions, including the American Federation of Teachers, the Communication Workers of America, the Service Employees International Union, and the United Auto Workers, have signed on to the effort. But it's not always easy to keep the two causes united. In 2012, the Laborers' Union left the alliance due to disagreements over the Keystone XL pipeline. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. <laughs> I know it seems like a pet peeve thing, but the the flag thing is important to me uh, because it does show us where we are as a country uh, when it comes to manufacturing. Uh, and look, you know, Sherrod Brown, the senator from Ohio who's up for re-election, and I hope Ohio, I hope you put that guy back in the Senate. Uh, I would love to see him as president someday. But here's a guy who's been well ahead of this. In 2000, 2011, they introduced the All-American Flag Act. And, and just, you know, last November... It again passed the the Homeland Security uh, Committee, uh, the Senate Committee on the Homeland Security and Government, uh, unanimously passed out completely. Why isn't this already law? Where all this was saying, all the uh, All American Flag Act was saying, is that the federal government won't spend any money on on foreign made flags. That if the fl- federal government is going to raise a flag, it has to be made in the U.S. by law, and it, it's enforceable. You know, you go back to, and this none of this is new. And it doesn't seem like we're ever interested in really solving the problem. You know, for instance, you think about, I go back to the Bush years where people were talking about, you know, the, 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 you know, the fabric soldiers were using, uh, you know, because we were sending soldiers off in the war, you know, wearing uh, uniforms that were made by, by, by China. And you go, well, what does it matter? And it... it it matters that you don't have the capacity to produce what you need. And it's 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 a much bigger problem than just the flag. It then it equates to everything else. If you can't agree on the American flag being made here, the an icon of our society where some want to, you know, idealize it to the point uh, of, you know, <laughs> Uh, breaking one of the Ten Commandments that they want posted everywhere. That should at least, at least, be made here. And and it shouldn't be this difficult. I mean, the first time Brown put this forth, 2011. Uh, but you go back to, you know, after 2001, you know, after we, we were attacked on 9-11 uh, and, and flag consumption went skyrocketed. A good majority of those flags were produced by foreign countries. And you go, why is that? Um, Because imports can be so much cheaper. You can use uh, abusive labor tactics, environmental standards, all this this stuff that they don't have to deal with. 
And what the rights argument has always been, well, we need to cut those things. We need to make our our workers as desperate and as exploitable as the Chinese. Because that's always been the argument, that we're losing manufacturing. And it will come back one day when American workers are hungry enough and desperate enough to do dangerous jobs for poverty wages. That's always been the argument, that we can't compete with those countries because they're willing to do things that you know, Americans just aren't willing to do it anymore. And you know, most people don't want to put them, their lives in danger so that corporations can profit. At least that's kind of how it used to be. So I find it interesting that that's where we are today. Just really an amazing, amazing thing. But, you know, here we are. I want to hear your thoughts. Am I making too much of this? Do you think this is uh, much ado about nothing? Or do you see it as, you know, the, the, the canary in the coal mine? That one little thing that wakes up the rest of us to everything else. Uh, that's how I see it. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. Miss any portion of the program, grab the podcast, freespeech.org for video. As always, appreciate you being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email Rick. at rick at thericksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.